well. And I'm, I'm pleased to be able to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Patricia Alvarez Estacio. Today's speaker is an exceptionally creative person. She's at once a documentary filmmaker, an anthropological researcher, and an assistant professor at Brandeis University, just around the corner from us. As we will get a glimpse today, her research cuts across many domains. She looks at clothing design, textile arts, and animal agriculture. She has a long history of engagement with indigenous communities in the Andes, particularly the groups of mainly women who are contracted to knit luxury clothing for the international supply chains of often quite prestigious high fashion firms. She examines the emergence of opaca wool as a global commodity and theorizes about the possibilities and limits of a more ethical capitalism. At a moment when so many are concerned with how their consumption implicates them in complicated, non-transparent, and often disturbing situations, Dr. Alvarez Estacio illuminates segments of the supply chains that constitute the material existence of us and so many people. She is currently completing a book on this research for the University of California Press titled Moral Fibers, Making Fashion Ethical. Her film on fashion supply chains, Entre Tejido, pre premiered at the Havana International Film Festival and received significant recognition and honors at the Houston Film Festival in 2017. She is also currently producing a film here in the United States titled Backside on the lives of Latinx workers who care behind the scenes for the horses that race in the Kentucky Derby. And I also just say she has been a real friend to this university. She showed films here, collaborated with faculty, and she even helped me construct a 2020 course, Fiber and Fashion, in which her burgeoning and unique research program played a starring role. So please join me in welcoming um, Professor Alvarez Estacio to the Hoku Lecture Series. Thanks, Alex, for that extremely generous and wonderful um, introduction. Um, I really enjoy our conversations and collaborations and the ability to, you know, be in dialogue with um, faculty and students at Tufts. Like uh, Professor Blanchett mentioned, we're kind of institutional neighbors. Um, so let me get the slides going. I'm a very visual person, so there will be a lot of images um, today as part of my, my talk. Uh, ah, sorry about that. Um, oh, it's not letting me. Okay. Um, For what it's worth, that works well on our end. Yeah, it's just for, I'm having issues then trying to, uh, I don't know why it's not working now with splitting my screen here. Um, so I hate to. Take your time, do what works. <laughs> I played with this yesterday and it worked and now I'm having issues, but. Um, Maybe I'll have to do this for now. That looks fine on mine. <laughs> okay, so second, um, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, so on January 19th of 2022, National Geographic published an article that compelled me to come back and kind of rework this talk that I'm giving today and apologies for the slide situation. It's probably driving me crazier than <laughs> most. Um, and the article is titled, um, The High Altitude Quest to Save Alpacas, was discussing the impact that climate change is having on alpaca herding practices. And I was very surprised to see a widely circulating publication discussing a topic um, maybe I'll not have that many slides, um, discussing a topic that has been so central in my research um, and a very, well, that has been a very serious issue um, 
in my field sites for over a decade now. The rapid retreat of glaciers has been threatening the water supply of all living beings in the Andean highlands, humans and non-humans ones. In certain areas, um, mostly Bolivia and some parts of Peru, Andean communities have, some of them have had to relocate due to lack of water. Out of season hailing is regularly destroying the limited agricultural crops that grow in high altitudes and it has forced many to enter into new arenas of economic activity that include the alpaca wool trade and textile manufacturing. Furthermore, as the article talks about, the increasingly cold weather is affecting the lives of humans and non-human animals alike. Even the famed, warm, luxurious, and sustainable fur of alpacas is not enough for them to survive um, winter. Five winters. Um, yet, as we see in this image here, the world in the worlds of fashion, alpaca is still touted as this kind of always already sustainable material. Alpaca wool has been oh, sorry, Oops, wrong slide. Alpaca wool has become a favored material in ethical and sustainable fashion markets due to its luxurious qualities and this kind of always already sustainable nature. But despite its over 200 year existence, the alpaca wool industry relies to this day on the herding and animal care practices of Quechua speaking herders in the Peruvian highlands that haven't changed much despite many other changes um, that we've seen in industrialization and economic development. And alpaca wool is touted as sustainable due to this intimate ties to Andean indigeneity. That is, to how indigenous forms of alpaca care and knowledge about this wool become part of the supply chain. And this industry's recognition of the value of Andean forms of animal care and material knowledge actually reaffirm a centralizing view of indigenous peoples as stewards of nature who have this unique connection to a grand pre-Hispanic past um, that enables them to maintain this kind of balanced and unique relationship to nature. But like indigenous scholars um, like Zoe Todd have been arguing, this vision of indigenous peoples as stewards of nature is kind of enabling additional forms of extraction, right? Where indigenous ways of knowledge become just another pool from which to extract ways of tackling the environment and provide solutions um, to the environmental degradation that is brought about by this kind of Eurocentric um, dualist view between nature and culture and the settler colonial and capitalist processes that have caused the disenfranchisement of indigenous peoples worldwide. And today I argue that this persistence of indigenous forms of breeding, animal care, and material knowledge in the alpaca wool supply chain are not only read by fashion actors and consumers, right, as an assurance of sustainability, but actually they're sustaining this essentializing view of indigenous peoples as environmental stewards in ways that obscure how extreme poverty, labor exploitation, state abandonment, and climate change are actually making this material pretty unsustainable. Um, and I want to go back really quick to the Nat Geo article because I think it lays out to you know a lot of this kind of um, critiques that I'm posing. Right um, outside of Peru, I had never heard anyone actually kind of talk about climate change and environmental issues in relation to the sustainable alpaca wool industry. And reading the article made it clear that the effects of climate change kind of just seem to matter when its impacts threaten the main economic source of livelihood in high altitude regions, which is the largest non-extractive industry in that area. Um, and of course, would also threaten the rapidly expanding global markets for sustainable and ethical fashions. And the article's discussion centered on how climate change is not just threatening the species, 
After all, alpacas can live in any altitude. Australia and the US actually have the second and third largest alpaca herds. But the key threat posed by climate change hinges on the fact that the wool of alpacas who live at lower altitudes is not of good quality. Multiple environmental factors of the high altitude environment, particularly the puna pokasha or the, the grasses that grow in the puna, which is the environment where the alpacas live between 3,500 meters and 5,000 meters um, above sea level, which is 12,000 to 15,000 feet. Um, you know, that the grasses that eat there, that they eat, allow them to grow a softer, warmer coat. And it's because of this that the alpaca wool industry has never developed in an industrially competitive way outside of Peru. Furthermore, the article made compelling the topic by mobilizing the kind of usual tropes of indigenous exoticism. You know, it talked about the threat it poses an in indigenous communities, quote, who have herded alpacas for generations as far back as they remember, which this is kind of language I oftentimes heard about for people signaling this incaic past without explicitly saying it, unless you kind of push them further in conversation. It also mentioned how, quote, in the 16th century herds tended by the Inca empire were all but wiped out after Spanish conquerors arrived in 1532. And basically, saying that the alpaca survived due to the care and knowledge of indigenous peoples. The article also emphasized how indigenous knowledge that is inherited from this grand incaic past is providing ways of addressing climate change as herders are turning to pre-Columbian pre technology to build canals that trap the ever diminishing water supply to save both the animals and the industry. But nowhere in the article, you could find a discussion on the severe impact climate change is having on the lives of alpaqueros, right? The alpaca herders, which is one of Peru's most impoverished populations. Nor does it address the longstanding practices that have made this industry one of the most exploitative in all of Peruvian history. As I read this article, I kept thinking back to a specific moment from my fieldwork in 2010. If I can show an image of this. Um, I want to quickly give an image of the kind of herding kind of environment. Um, I was in the alpaca herding community that you're seeing here. Um, that is located right above the city of Huancavelica in the central Andes. And I was doing field work there in artisanal workshops, but many artisans came from this community and had family there and would also herd alpacas. Alberto, the direct director of the local NGO that works with herders to address issues of exploitation, but also with the artisans as a liaison between the artisans and fashion brands and designers, had brought that day two visitors with him from veterinary alpaca NGOs. The herders received this guest with complaints. They started, alpacas are dying, it's too cold, it's harder to find green pastures. The same issues raised over a decade later in the Nat Geo article. And one of the alpaca NGO workers replied to the herders query saying, weren't you given blankets for the alpacas? So one of the veterinary NGOs um, had given alpaqueros warm, heavy blankets to put on the alpacas overnight to keep them warm and prevent them from dying of cold. The herders went quiet and avoided the gazes of their visitors. Alberto stepped in, turning to his NGO colleagues and said, and I kind of quote this because I, I was filming this whole interaction. Um, they took the blankets to use for themselves and their families. If the alpacas are cold, imagine how cold they are. Also, those electric shears you gave them, useless. There is no electricity here. Looking back in the, my entries in my field notebook for that day, I wrote, quote, blankets, also useless. Um, <laughs> a great part of the sustainable value of alpaca wool is, is because alpacas are herded according to indigenous autochthonous ways, which means 
no stables, no barns, no fences until very, very recently. But alpacas are free to roam around in their environment. Herders take the alpacas to estancias each season, right? To different, to greener pastures where they have small homes. Um, and the animals' movements, the inclement of the high altitude weather, the strong Andean winds, hail, rain, it would rapidly destroy the blankets. Moreover, it takes hours walking through multiple mountain passes to arrive at each seasonal estancia. Who is gonna walk those distances through that terrain, carrying the necessary human provisions and piles of blankets for all the alpacas on top of that, right? How is this a sustainable solution? Um, show this really quickly. Sorry for my PowerPoint dance. It's thrown off guard that my system wasn't working. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about sustainability now, because it has become a cultural category that's full of moral and ethical value in our capitalist system. In a way, it has come to signify such a wide array of vague ideals and even more loosely defined practices. Industries can implement sustainable practices, development can unfund sustainably, we can consume sustainably. But as many scholars and activists that are critical of development and the green economy have noted, sustainability is an oxymoronic concept. The interests that drive sustainability cannot harmonize the needs of nature and the development of communities with any conventional model of capitalist economies. And as anthropologist Arturo Escobar states, quote, this notion of a green economy kind of corroborates those critics' views that what is what that what is to be sustained with sustainable development more than the environment or nature is the particular capitalist model of the economy and this entire dualist technology that keeps nature um, separate and distinct from culture and the realm from, of humans where nature is there for us to use. Um, proponents of ontological design such as John Ehrenfeld have noted that modern solutions to this forms of so-called sustainable development and the green economy will not do as unsustainability is a problem that springs from the cultural structure of modernity itself. Walter Benjamin long, long ago noted that fashion is the barometer of both modernity and capitalism. For him, you cannot separate the fashion as industry from fashion as culture. And the industrial side of fashion gives us insights into how capitalism is unfolding, what new directions is taking. For example, fashion brands were some of the first to embrace the kind of immaterial turn of the economy, not having factories and solely becoming marketing, branding, and design firms, right? And from then on, we kind of saw mass outsourcing and other industries follow suit. On the cultural side, fashion produces objects that bring into being the ideal modern subjects that inhabit this capitalist world, such as the ethical and sustainable modern consumer who can enact their ethics, ethics by consumption. And now we can literally wear our ethics. And so in the world of fashion as well, there is no single or accepted definition of what ethical means or what counts as sustainable. Ethics and sustainability can happen at the level of design, production, retail, or consumption. It can mean promoting worker autonomy, fostering artisanal manufacture, paying fair wages, obtaining organic or fair trade certifications, or supporting a wide array of environmental practices. You can use natural materials, avoid synthetic dyes, minimize the use of water. And this open-endedness gives corporations a lot of flexibility regarding what practices count, right, as sustainable. So brands can combine and recombine ethical and sustainable practices with non-ethical, non-sustainable ones to maintain a production rhythm that keeps up to pace with the seasonal demands of fashion which in and of itself, that seasonal demand is probably the most unsustainable practice of them all. And so I have here three examples. You know, Levi's can minimize their use of water, but completely ignore labor issues. H&M can develop their ethical fashion lines while simultaneously continuing their fast fashion unsustainable ones, 
without any issue. And then we have Patagonia, who works hard to avoid exploitative labor and use sustainable materials. But when have we heard them talk about the types of dyes and the kind of that seepage of water that goes for us to have the bright colors, right? And the array of colors that they offer, right? Um, so despite all of this, concerns with sustainability have brought a renewed attention to the kinds of materials that are used in fashion, which is something that in our Western culture of dress, we've ignored for a really long time. And I want to hone in and zoom back in into alpaca wool. And alpaca wool is very differently valued by Andean communities than it is in the fashion industry. Um, and as this material moves through the supply chain, this kinds of different system of values become knotted with each other. Um, and at the core of each system is this differing understanding of this relationship between humans and nature. And to illustrate the kind of Andean kind of valuation of alpaca wool, I want to share another moment from my field work where I was with uh, Senora Camila, who worked for a grassroots NGO that also works with artisans. And she told me one day, quote, Paticita, they, referring to the alpacas, are very important to us. This is a very special animal. It gives us food, it clothes us, and keeps us warm. They're very special, Patti. Do you feel it? Can you feel how special they are? Can you feel how special their wool is? And like a previous anthropo Peruvian anthropologist, Juan Flores, had noted, alpacas have been vital in sustaining human development in the harsh high altitude and an environment. So because of this, many cultural art aspects circulate around alpacas, their care, and the products obtained from them. So the value of alpacas is tied to Andean cosmovision and to the Andean stru community structure called the Aiju. And in the Aiju includes humans and other than humans, right? Animals, plants, mountain, lakes, and they're all connected. Because of these connections, objects are not the objects, right? They're not there for us to simply use. Animate and inanimate worlds are, are interconnected to the human. We're all codependent on each other. Um, so this means that our existence with nature and matter depends on relationality and interdependence. So matter can act upon us. And when we act, as humans act upon matter, that entails responsibility. Furthermore, alpacas within this cosmovision have the unique capacity of crossing over between human and non-human realms. And as they move across these worlds, their wool, right, is kind of weaving together this Andean community structure and weaving and uniting those relationships of responsibility and care. Thus, when an alpaca is sheared, the connection and the responsibility with the animal in a way is never really severed when as wool becomes other objects. Alpaca wool is not a product of alpacas, right? The act of shearing actually ties you into a relation of care and responsibility. But in fashion, as we all know, <laughs> matter is inert and like nature, is there available for women's, and as part of nature, um, is there for women to work on it, use it, and transform it creatively according to our needs? Matter is the object of human subjects. Um, and this perspective changed, shapes how wool is valued, right? Alpaca wool matters because it's comparable to cashmere, it's sustainable, it's one of the warmest natural fibers, it's soft, light in weight, it's resistant to water flames and wrinkles, it's durable, it retains most dyes, right? It's one of the fibers that minimizes the seeping out of chemical dyes and has hypo hypoallergenic qualities. And while some alpaca wool products are explicitly marked as organic, sustainable, or natural, products that are not marketed as such can still be considered sustainable because almost all of the garments sold are made with the same wool obtained from the same Andean herders. 
So all of this bulk wool is funneled principally into two massive industrial th threaderies that have maintained a monopoly over the pr processing of wool for almost a century. And alpaca care, herding and shearing practices, like I mentioned earlier, haven't drastically changed before sustainability became a thing. And all of the family members in a community are involved in the care of alpacas. Alpaca care, even though everyone is involved, alpaca care is a gendered activity with men mostly in charge of the animals, shearing and negotiating the sale of bulk wool to the processing companies. Women and children help care for the herds, mainly by taking them out to graze. And many of my Andean interlocutors would refer to some of their alpacas as part of the family. Um, and so this structure has been sustained. We don't see the industrialization found in other agribusinesses like the kind of pork industry um, studied by Professor Blanchett, right? Um, so while veterinarians do work with alpacas, um, the kind of pre-existing animal care practices shaped by Andean Cosmovision allow those fashion actors to claim that wool is sustainable, right? Animals are not confined, like I mentioned. They are well cared for. There's no use of medicines other than it's necessary. We don't find the diseases that rapidly spread in agribusiness settings. Um, you know, all of the issues this like, so well discussed in Professor Blanchett's work. Um, there's no genetic modifications. Um, babies are not separated from their mothers. There's no chemicals in their foods, right? They eat this naturally growing grasses. And so while this bucolic vision of indigeneity helps sustain and value Quechua knowledge in forms of animal care and relationality, it obscures the sinister forms of exploitation that sustain conditions of extreme poverty and the impacts of climate change. Communities located in these altitudes, right, in, in, in this high altitude environment um, currently suffer from a lot of health related issues associated with malnutrition. And I'm more than happy to talk more about that because the expansion of quinoa as a globally desired healthy superfood has greatly contributed to this. Um, children must walk for hours to reach their school or they have to be sent to live with family, friends or other or contacts in other communities at lower altitudes to continue schooling. And oftentimes when they do this, they go to another community they end up working in textile workshops to pay for food and boarding. Access to high altitude communities is notoriously difficult with dirt roads that become impossible to transit during the rainy season. There's no electricity or running water in most communities unless a nearby, nearby mine has electrified an area to sustain its operations. And even then electricity is very precarious. And repurposing a common adage used in reference to mining, many of the artisans and herders I worked with would say that they were beggars sitting on top of a gold mine. In this iteration of the saying, alpaca wool stands in for actual gold. So while communities have their own herds, it's important to note that they also care for alpacas owned by the threaderies I mentioned. Um, which I'll get back to in a minute. Um, let me get show another image here. Oh, zoom. What happened to my? Okay. Um, due to this lack of electricity, shearing to this day is done with scissors rather than with electric shears. Alpacas are sheared once a year when the rainy season ends. And to this day, the end of the alpaca bearing season um, and the start of shearing is celebrated with a tinka de alpaca, a ceremony in which alpacas are paid homage. It's a token of reciprocity and recognition of those Aiju responsibilities between human and non-human worlds that form the community. The ritual serves to thank Pachamama for good bearing and for sustaining the lives of the herd. It also allows herders to secure the future health and fertility 
of their herds and call for abundant pastures. Threading corporations send representatives to participate and support the Tinka with donations of beer, rice, sugar. And participating from this celebration cements corporations as part of the Aiju of the community. Partaking in those events helps them secure contracts for bulk wool that then, right, and the event itself then is proof of sustainability, right? Um, but this kind of connection that serves to assure sustainability and secure wool contracts sustains a lot of exploitation as all of my interlocutors, herders, artisans, NGO workers, government bureaucrats told me over and over again, this stage of the supply chain is the most exploitative. Wool is bought in bulk, categorically unsorted and paid for by paid for in weight. Communities created, you know, that in commitments created through corporate Aiju participation serve to assure corporations that the wool is not going to be sold to any potential competitor or newcomer to the industry. This practice has started to change in the latter half of the 2010s. Corporations also mobilize their Aiju membership to avoid paying the market prices for the wool by fulfilling other community Aiju responsibilities like being part of the Tinka, they have gotten away with paying under market value for the wool for decades. And I even heard stories that sometimes artisans would get paid in food items and partly in money. And the main income of these communities is the sale of bulk wool that happens once a year. And so an average, a herder will make between $300 to $500 a year for selling the wool of all of their herds, um, which if we think about $300 to $500, one sustainable ethical designer brand garment can cost you that, right? Um, furthermore, out of season hailing that's happening with climate change is destroying the crops that herders use for their own consumption or to sell in markets to supplement their income. Many her herders are becoming then even more reliant on what on the income obtained from selling their alpaca wool. As one of my int artisanal interlocutors told me, quote, now we need additional money to buy food that we used to grow and what we make from selling the wool is not enough. Finally, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, rape, you know, glacier melting is not only diminishing water necessary for humans, animals, and the sustenance of pastures, but glaciers created protection from colder temperatures. So friadas, right? Kind of this kind of increasingly cold weather is decimating the herds that now are even more important for artisans to make a livelihood as they cannot rely on agriculture and other activities. Um, and going back to this kind of idea that a alpaca wool garment can cost you $300, right? The income of the herder. Um, the lux that luxury price not only reflects brand value and design elements, but it also includes how the wool is categorized. What, what category of wool is used with the softest and lightest types being the most economically valued. And alpaca wool is categorized based on the thickness of the fiber. Let me show uh, again. Some, right. With the th thickness of the fiber, which is measured in microns, the smaller the diameter of the fiber, the softer and lighter the wool feels to the, in the skin without affecting any of its other qualities, including warmth. But yet this categorizations of natural, organic and sustainable apply to all grades of alpaca wool because all of the categories come from the same animal. No, baby alpaca doesn't mean the baby gets sheared, <laughs> which is a question I, I get a lot. You know, one, a single alpaca will have areas of softer, higher quality fiber and areas with coarser, coarser thicker fiber that is lower grade. And there is still no technology or industrial process that allows 
industry to measure the thickness of fibers to help sort to help a quicken this process. Um, and Juan Carlos, the general manager of an industrial garment factory, told me once, the only technology we have available to sort out bulk fiber would be to place each individual fiber, each hair under a micron microscope to measure the diameter. This is impossible to do. We would never finish sorting one single shipment of wool. So in lieu of a techno-scientific solution to industrialize this process, alpaca wool is sorted and categorized via touch, a touch that can recognize the feel of this microscopic differences in fiber thickness. And at this stage of the supply chain, the industries and corporations rely on the material knowledge of Andean, wo Andean women, most of whom brace alpacas and are artisans. And so alpaca wool, the threaderies, I'll show one image of this process, which I, um, they hire, the factories hire Quechua women to sort the bulk wool, bulk wool into the hierarchically valued categories before sending the wool to be threaded. Um, Indian women are seen as having this unique material knowledge that emerges from their intimate engagement with alpacas, the wool, and the textile traditions. Women have learned from a young age how to recognize and identify how this material feels in a way how it acts upon their skin. And while most non-Indigenous people that are part of this supply chains, myself included, can learn to recognize the difference between this and categories because they have obvious tactile differences, right? Like baby alpaca versus regular, it's very difficult to develop what Natasha Myers calls an affectivity of matter, right? A kind of nuanced embodied tactile knowledge and expert sensoria to differentiate by hand between categories that are really close in their thickness, such as baby alpaca and royal alpaca, but that economically have a significant difference in their price. While not every Kutcha woman might develop this knowledge, it is assumed that because of their indigeneity, any Kutcha speaking woman can do this work. Since alpaca herders, alpacas are sheared once a year, women who sort are employed for a few months a year. The payment is a closely guarded secret. People I talked to either did not know how much they were paid or had been sworn to secrecy, right? They didn't want to tell me because telling me the, you know, the, the payment would potentially break those I drew responsibilities. Um, however, I do know that women get paid by how much pounds of wool they sort. Um, and even though I no, never found out the amount of payment, everyone assured me it was not near enough the appropriate value of the unique knowledge and skill that is necessary. It is definitely not enough to successfully supplement the income obtained from the sale of bulk wool or to kind of help address the economic impacts climate change is having. If alpaca wool um, is already you know, if um, sorry, corporations have tried to hinder activist efforts that are encouraging herders to sell the wool sorted into categories rather than in bulk. And corporations have paused and stopped this effort because they claim that they're offering employment to Andean women. And but in reality, if the wool is already sorted, companies would have to pay market value per category of wool, which is something they don't do now. And this would increase significantly the income for herders, right? So they would mean actually earn more by selling the wool um, sorted already than, in, than selling it in bulk and then being hired to sort it. Um, and this categorization is very important because of prices, as I mentioned earlier. Um, exploitation aside, non-Indigenous actors have to contend and depend on a form of knowledge that's inaccessible and indispensable to them. The reliance of this tactile knowledge of casual women further bolsters the industry's claims of sustainability and showing us the intimate ways through which sustainability is depending on Indigenous knowledge. 
Um, and it is not rare to hear in, in the industry itself to, to hear people talk about sorting as an expert way that has stayed the same, a kind of knowledge that has circulated uninterrupted since the Inca empire, right? It's manually, there's no machinery, it's all natural. Because of this, there's a hefty price tag that comes with ethical and sustainable garments. These are garments that allow us to feel fashionable, modern, and ethical. Um, the, I want to show some fashion. Um, the price tags that I'm talking about also includes, you know, a sustainable value that emerges from imaginary unspoiled landscapes in which alpacas from free, from this romanticized ideal indigenous way of life where animals uncared for in the best possible way, you know, sustaining an environmental balance, where they, where the knowledge, right, that is used to keep this industry sustainable, you know, has been around since the Inca empire. And so a lot of high-end brands like the ones you see here, use slogans like touch the magic of the Andes, get in touch with nature, make your fashion statement kind, natural, and entirely timeless. They emphasize how alpaca herding prevents land degradation, but they all fail to mention, right, those consequences of climate change. Um, and these images of sustainability obscure those historically exploitative nature of the industry that I've been discussing. They also rely on essentializing perceptions of indigeneity um, that allows us to feel the price tag is worth it and that through our consumption, we can make a difference. Brands and designers also rely on fashion editorials to convince consumers of this always already sustainable value. Fashion editorials like the ones we see here show white thin models wearing fashionable wools posing in high altitude unspoiled landscapes with the Andean mountains, glacier lakes, alpaca herds in the background. The images use this very soft lighting to create an atmospheric feeling, right? Because atmospheres succeed what it's represented. They emanate, they radiate, they flow affect our bodies, how we perceive and interpret them. Um, atmospheres combine the sensuous experience with the social and the cultural. They allow us to interpret and feel, right, social and cultural meanings that we're consuming. And in doing so, the dreamlike romantic or bucolic era of Andean ways of life, right, further are tied to pristine landscapes as the signifiers of sustainability. It reassures us as consumer of the authenticity of indigenous manufacturers, of indigenous peoples as stewards of nature whose animal care practices, right, allow us to have this balance with nature. But the images de-emphasize producers while emphasizing their presence via presupposed respect towards their way of life, knowledge, and skills. The images soften the harshness of the high altitude environment and climate changes faced by all beings who inhabit them. They serve to reimagine the not so glamorous realities of indigenous communities, images that would undoubtedly threaten the luxury value of alpaca wool and its sustainable quality. Like the Nat Geo article, sustainable brands directly take us back to this value of pre-Hispanic practices as an assurance of sustainability and hope of possible solutions to things like climate change. Um, but while it is also extremely important to finally recognize and give due value to indigenous forms of knowledge and traditions that have been discredited as superstitious, as markers of primitivity and you know, associated with ugliness and the, you know, inability to be modern and fashionable, uh, modern subjects, these recognitions come with a dark flip side. The celebrations of the value of Andean indigeneity um, are hiding how indigenous folks are not being properly remunerated for not their knowledge, skill, and labor. While they become visible, they are simultaneously being remitted back to an unspoiled, unmodern past rather than as present day peoples and workers. 
Um, networks of subcontracting in the fashion industry continue to go unchanged and unquestioned in and of themselves um, in the ways in which they hinder sustainability and further hide um, the unsustainable conditions that alpaca herders and alpacas grab grapple with for their daily survival. Um, the celebrations of pre-Hispanic indigenous knowledge are used to leave herders coming up with solutions themselves to manage life, to manage and live with climate change in order to salvage their precarious income in an industry that is structured around their knowledge and their exploitation. Current discourses of sustainability not only exploit indigenous labor, land and knowledge, but can serve as an excuse to let indigenous folks to figure out on their own how to keep on living and allow others to capitalize on the ways in which they mobilize indigenous techniques or other contemporary ideas they have that are then reinterpreted as ancestral. Um, as many have noted before, environmental sustainability cannot be attained, obtained if we treat labor as a separate disconnected realm. Unsustainability is produced through capitalist practices that rely on the simultaneous exploitations of human and, and nature. Um, and sustainability cannot be produced when approach sustaining this dualist perception this kind of binary divide between humans and nature, a perception that lies at the core of capitalism, settler colonialism, and is thus at the heart of sustainable and ethical industries, including fashion, probably more fashion than many others. Um, but I, rather than kind of wrap up in a way my, my article in, in the form of a usual conclusion, I wanna end this talk with kind of some word of cautions that the more I present on this work, the more I feel are important to mention. Um, to truly redefine sustainability as a set of practices whose main concern is to not threaten how capitalist value is accrued, we need what some have called, um, at least from the world of design, um, a cultural upheaval that needs to unfold alongside a massive shift away from our current capitalist economic system. First, we need to change how we define fashion, culturally define fashion, that is. We need a cultural re-understanding of our relationship to clothing and how clothing defines us as individuals. Second, we need to shift our perception that we can enact change and be environmentally minded, ethical, and socially responsible through our consumer practices. Um, I'm not saying, we go and not consume sustainably or ethically organic, but we need to not have the illusion that what we do through those avenues has that big of an impact. Third, whatever measures are taken to change the structure of an industry like fashion, to minimize its human and environmental exploitation, um, those measures cannot be ones that cause further harm to the millions of workers in this industry, workers that in their majority are indigenous, people of color in the global south, but also in the north, in the you know, in Europe and in the United States. Garment workers are mostly women of color. And the majority of workers who are women of color and children. Um, to truly start figuring out sustainable solutions, maybe a place to start might not be putting so much value and attention on natural, organic, um, and sustainable. I, 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 have, I have conflicting with the statement, right? But I think there's an overemphasis on this material is sustainable, right? And I think we need to bring less emphasis on that as like a starting point. Um, because that shimmer of a natural organic material, right? doesn't force us to reckon with the need to revalue and alter our relationship with garment workers, textile producers, herders um, that are just kind of always kept invisible or who are made visible 
um, via romantic images, right, that mask ongoing exploitation, right, or images that emphasize environmental harm at the expense of the precarity of indigenous peoples and workers um, of color and in the global south. Um, emphasis, such an emphasis on material um, and, and not questioning of specifically what are the environmental practices like and how does this relate to labor um, will just really not lead to the urgent need for sustainability for lack of a word, better word that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have about uh, seven minutes for questions and I, I've got one online. That's okay. It, um, but um, uh, <laughs> this might be a um, utopian um, pie in the sky question, um, perhaps that risks reproducing the National Geographic sensibility itself. Um, from a different angle, but, and you might push back here, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I'm, I might be misinterpreting this, but when I hear a lot of this, I, I kind of think of a lot of these threaderies and so forth as kind of parasitical. I mean, the story you seem to be telling is that all of the labor, all of the skill, all of the knowledge, all of the work, ultimate, all that is ultimately indispensable flows through um, the, the workers themselves, right? And so, again, maybe pie in the sky, I guess I had two questions. One within the kind of cultural ideals or what have you of the IU, can the threaderies be expropriated and taken over by the communities themselves? Two, and I think this might get to one of the themes of your points, is the if the risk if like say indigenous communities did take over more of the supply chain, did take over the threaderies and so forth, would that sort of, um, fact of taking over these industrial supply chains risk um, then making their goods no longer um, privileged and so forth because they no longer quite fit this model that's been thrown onto them as timelessly authentic. Those are really great questions. Um, and you have, I don't think you've misinterpreted what I've been talking about. So they have, there have been multiple attempts throughout history to challenge threaderies. Um, that have failed because of the the different roles corporations have built with each community, right? So they might have tighter belonging in some than in others. Um, and when there have been attempts by indigenous people to take on and buy machinery and create their own threaderies. Um, either they've been sabotaged, right? Corporate sabotage is um, and spying is something you see in the Andes and that extractivist corporations do regularly. Um, and the ones that continue working end up just working for local Andean markets. Um, and so now the landscape is slowly changing, but threaderies are still in the hands of non-Indigenous peoples. The amount of capital you need to invest in that machinery is just something very hard for folks to be able to amass. Um, if Indigenous folks were able to take over the supply chain, I think a lot of people would like that. <laughs> um, but I, I do, feel like what you mentioned is precisely the excuse as to why it's not a good idea for indigenous peoples to take over, right? Because artisans and indigenous folks are not well-versed. They don't participate in fashion, right? They need to be taught good design. Um, they are not the face of luxury, right? So if they were to take over the industry, then probably, right, um, it would end up becoming an ethnic industry that produces kind of ethnic goods rather than 
kind of mass globals, right? I, I don't necessarily think this is the case, but I think this is the perception. And I think this is a perception that will would hinder big and important efforts and would limit what folks from indigenous from Quechua and other indigenous communities could actually achieve if they were to have more power in the industry, right? But this is kind of like a big cultural perceptive wall, right? Which is why it's hard to disentangle fashion industry from, from fashion culture. Um, Thank you. We, we have a question from um, Mindy Nirenberg here at um, um, Tisch College at Tufts. Um, I can't thank you enough for this fascinating talk. I have two questions. In the tourist focused shops and stalls in the Sacred Valley um, sell relatively expen inexpensive alpaca clothing. Are these laced with other fibers? What impact do the seemingly pervasive sale of these items have on the alpaca farmers you are discussing? And then following up, um, a student in a Tish program we had prior to the pandemic in Urubamba worked at Tika Centro de Producción Textil in Chinchero District, Cusco. It was a women's co cooperative that produced their own goods, spun the yarn, made their own natural dyes, et cetera, and sold them to tourists. Is there a way that small co-ops like this could be organized and you and produce goods for luxury brands to provide higher incomes for them? Um, that's, that's a great question. Um, I know the 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 CETA, I can really speak to this. Um and sorry, the Centro de Producción Textil. Um so it depends. At market, when you see alpaca wool sold at those markets, it's lower grade alpaca. And if you touch it and it feels itchy, it's 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 intertwined, it's mixed with sheep's wool, right? Which makes lowers even the, the price. And what's interesting is that a lot of those artisans um they also produce textiles for the supply chains I'm talking about, right? So you can have the same person making a cheaper sweater sold in a tourist market and then like knitting something for for Dior, for Tom Ford, for Vivian Westwood, right? So it's the kind of same handwork. Um, but that's kind of another issue of like consistency of contracts and in this kind of more fashion oriented supply chains. Um, and also the quality level, right? There's not the same kind of quality expectations for selling in tourist markets, right? That keep the price low and they don't have to have the same kind of level of this design and question I have a lot of questions around what's good design or what we think it is um and that's why you see this dramatic um difference in, in prices um and so the the center production textile is, is a very unique and important co-op um their major aim is not just income generation right like they have they haven't just kind of reproduced that logic because then income generation would mean like kind of work for the market but they're really concerned with it's an activism organization concerned with the preservation and perpetuation of um quechua culture right so to kind of enable economic development on the terms of quechua culture right so they're they're kind of a very important particular kind of co-op um and most of the artisans workshops i worked in throughout the andes are small co-ops like that not all of them have the same explicit political activist kind of aim um and and i think that you know um small co small co-ops have a lot of promise because they have a lot of freedom in a way and can pose big challenges to the way supply chains work, right? And, and I talk in my work and other areas about the ways in which sometimes they resist, even the ones that aren't kind of very openly politicized. Um, uh, even, you know, that those politics operate kind of internally and more implicitly, um, but luxury brands go and look for right they have figured out a way in which they can still capitalize from the benefits of working with co-ops right because then that's something that goes to their branding right they put the image of the artisans right um the other thing is that then they because of networks of subcontracting they can create competition between workshops and co-ops 
um, because they were hired last time and then they hired this one and not that one. And, and, and then it kind of fosters this capitalist competitiveness that of course, when you're dealing with folks from the same community can create other host of, of issues and disputes in a community. Um, and so there are some organizations that are trying to build groups out of co-ops, right? To try to create a politics, a united kind of politics across different um, small co-ops. And I, and I think that's actually what brings forth more possibilities to address some of the issues of exploitations and present a united front to the industry that can, you know, give enough pushback and not say like, oh, well, I'm just going to go work with the ones from this area that are not so difficult. Thank you very, very much um, for we, we need to end for the purposes of the class that is that's currently going. But if others have questions, um, perhaps we could stay on the line for a little bit longer. But uh, for now, please join me in thanking uh, Patricia for a wonderful talk. Sorry for missing the mark on time. <laughs>